What depression, discouragement, despair often brings is distorted information. Elijah is by himself. Depression gets worse if there's nobody in your life to change your thinking. See, if you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're talking to yourself, that's a bad conversation for yourself. You're already feeling sorry and there's nobody to talk to but you, about you, regarding you, to tell you what you ought to do and you aren't in a place to even hear you correctly, then your discussion with yourself is helping yourself to become worse off about you. So God then enters the picture and tells him, Elijah, tell me how you feel. Stop talking to yourself. Because when you talk to yourself, you were getting depressed, you were suicidal, start talking to me, okay? Now I'm going to show you the wind and the rain and all that stuff. Now y'all talk to me, because you talking to you is killing you. Since I don't want you to kill you, stop talking you to you, and y'all talk to me. God has an angel for you, he's got a person for you, he has himself for you. He gave Elijah all three of those to give him a supernatural experience to lift him out of his depression. And one of the reasons that the church exists is to have people available in your life when you are down who can embrace you, minister to you, lift you up, and he can use you to do the same thing for somebody else. Because when we are depressed, we need another perspective. That doesn't deny the reality of how we feel. But what it does is it doesn't let you live there. you away. 
away from the light. He wants to keep you in the dark. Everything changes when you know what the enemy thinks about you. Because listen, my friend, even if you don't believe what the Bible says about you, your enemy knows that what God says about you is absolutely true. So, <clears throat> so even if you don't believe it, you need to know that, that he knows that you and I are already victorious. Even if you don't believe it, he knows that you have been forgiven. Even if you don't believe it, the enemy knows that he is already under your feet. He knows that you have been given power and authority that he will never ever have access to. He knows that he can form a weapon against you, but that that weapon will never be able to prosper. He knows that since God is for you, nobody, not even him, can ever be against you. He knows that you have been made competent by God's Spirit. It would be a shame for the enemy to know all that stuff about us but us not know all that stuff about us. It would be a shame for the enemy to be more convinced about our potential and about our power than we are. Everything changes when you know what the enemy thinks about you. When you know, brother, sister, that when he sees you coming, he is shaking in his boots. There's that child of God that has the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkled on her. There is that man who is fighting for his family because of the Holy Spirit's power that works within him. Gideon is afraid. He's got 300 soldiers. They are going up against the Midianite camp. The Midianite army has 135,000 soldiers. The ratio is 450 to one. Talk about being the underdog. Gideon lacks courage and has complete overwhelming paralyzing insecurity but right before the battle God sends Gideon down to the enemy camp. He stations him right beside a tent where two men are talking. Gideon hears his name past the enemy's lips. He hears the enemy say that if Gideon and the 300 come that they know they are going to be annihilated. Gideon can't believe they even know who he is much less that they're afraid of him. But once he hears the enemy speak his name and realize that the enemy is so insecure thinking about Gideon and the 300 coming, a confidence overwhelms him. He is ready to go to battle knowing that the Lord will give the victory. It's the same way that you and I can leave this place on this Sunday morning approaching the battles that are in our daily lives. We can have security because now we know what the enemy thinks about us. Now we know that he already knows we have the victory. And so Gideon, confident and secure, is getting ready to go into battle. And in Judges chapter 7, he is getting ready to show us how to win a battle. Anybody interested in how to win a battle in your life? If you have your Bible with you, turn to Judges chapter 7 or your iPhone, your iPad, any manner of iness. Just flip on over to Judges chapter 7 because there are some details in here. There are many actually, but I'm going to pick three of them to share with you. Three things that are going to help us know how to advance into battle and claim the victory that is ours. Judges chapter 7 verse 15 starts this way. And it came about... When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation from those two men, that he bowed in worship. Let's just start right here. Gideon was once insecure and timid and paralyzed because he had no courage. Gideon now is closer to the battle than he has ever been. The, the rumors of the battle are what have permeated the verses leading up to this point, but now the battle is imminent. He is uh, more close and more uh, up close and personal with the dilemma than he has ever been before. But we see him making a decision to worship God in advance. He doesn't know how he's going to fight the battle. He doesn't know, have a strategy for what specifically he's supposed to do. He has no details yet on how he's supposed to instruct the 300 as to how they are to advance in battle. And yet he shows us that if we want to win a battle, we have to begin the battle on our knees. We have to choose to worship in advance before we see how God is going to work out the situation. And so he worshiped in the face of impending danger. He worshiped in the face of adversity. He worshiped even though he was still outnumbered and stretched far beyond his reach. He, re he worshiped before one instruction of strategy for warfare was given. He worshiped because the enemy was already afraid of him before the battle was, already, was begun. And 
So even in your circumstances, my friend, even if you have no idea how in the world God is going to fix the dilemma that you are facing in your life right now, the way you win a battle is to begin that battle on your knees. To make a decision to be the kind of man, to be the kind of woman that worships God in advance even though they have no clue of how God is going to work that situation out. Think about Joshua. He goes into the promised land with the children of Israel. And as soon as they cross the Jordan River, there is a battle to fight. Jericho sitting right there. The scriptures say that the walls were tightly shut up. That means they were pretty much impenetrable. They wanted to be secure. They had closed themselves up in tightly shut up walls. So that people could not get in and um, and wreak havoc in their city. But Joshua and the people of God surround them. God gives them instructions. He says for six days you walk around the walls. On the seventh day, here's what I want you to do. Walk around the wall seven times and then shout. And then the walls will come down. Don't wait for the walls to come down and then shout. Shout first before you have seen one brick fall from that impenetrable wall. Shout in advance and in response to your worship, I'll make those walls come tumbling down. I just wonder if the walls that you're waiting to come down in your life, you're waiting for the bricks to start falling and God's waiting for you to start falling. Down on your knees with your arms outstretched, thanking Him in advance for the victory in your life. You want to win the battle? Whatever battle you're facing, whether it's in your own mind or in your own heart or in your marriage or in your family, with your children, in your singleness, on your job. If you want to win the battle, if I want to win the battles of our life, we have to make a decision to begin the battles on our